Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's program. We are so excited to have Secretary of State Steve, St Steve Simon and Professor David Schultz here to talk about everything that has happened in the last week, and it has been quite a week. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone is muted and your cameras are turned off. Please keep everything turned off for the duration of the program. If you run into any technical problems, please send a high priority email to me, Carter at mnbars.org. If you've joined today's program by phone, please also send me an email so that I can confirm your attendance. Our event code for today is 332935. The credit hasn't yet been approved, but we anticipate it, anticipate that it will be soon. Um, I'll, we'll also post that in the chat box shortly. If you have any questions for our speaker, speakers, please post them in the chat box. On that note, I will turn it over to Secretary Simon and Professor Schultz. Take it away. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone's doing okay. We're all sort of... Um, trying to get our bearings back after this election, those of us who are immersed in this world. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. It's an honor to be here for a couple of reasons. One is I should point out that the Minnesota State Bar Association was a crucial and critical partner this year with our office and with others in terms of the election in one particular way, in general ways, but in one particular way. And the particular way was making members aware of the opportunity to serve as an election judge this year. One of the things that I'm gonna talk about briefly is the worry that we had earlier this year that we would face a real crunch, a real shortage. And MSBA really stepped up in letting you and, and other members know about that opportunity. And as a result, things worked out really well, as I'll explain in a minute. Second, it's a pleasure to be here because I'm a member. I'm the first um, Secretary of State since 1891 to be a lawyer. Not the first, but the first since 1891. So for some reason, Minnesota took a 120 plus year break in electing lawyers to this office, but we're back. So uh, it's great to be with you today and, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, we do a lot of things at the Office of Secretary of State. We wear a lot of hats, but there's no question that the responsibility and the set of duties that gets the most attention, the most interest, the most scrutiny, particularly this time of year, is the function of ch as Chief Elections Administrator for the state of Minnesota. So here's what we don't do in our office, just as a, a level set or a refresher. We don't count a single vote, never have. We don't handle ballots, we don't touch ballots, we don't do any of that. We don't hire, train, or pay any of the poll workers or the election judges. We don't own any election or tabulating equipment. All of those things happen in a decentralized way across 87 counties and hundreds of cities and townships across Minnesota. Um, but what we do is we coordinate those efforts. We oversee those efforts. Uh, we're sort of the umbrella, we do all the legislative work, we work to get federal and state funds to local elections administrators. We certify the results, which we'll be doing shortly. Uh, we certify the equipment and the like. And so I like to say as a result of that work that I and we in our office are in the democracy business. And it's a heck of a time to be in the democracy business. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, I wanna talk a little bit uh, in, in my brief time here before we go to questions about some of the many challenges that we faced this year. Obviously the pandemic, but there were more than that. This was an intense time this election year. It's still an intense time uh, because it's not over yet. All elections are intense and that's okay. They're meant to be intense. That's healthy and normal. They are a clash of ideas, a clash of aspirations, a clash of records and approaches and all the rest. There's nothing wrong or bad about that. Uh, presidential elections are even more intense for all the obvious reasons. But this year layered on top of all of that intensity was the fact that we were doing this during a once in a century pandemic. And that obviously uh, brought things to a new level. Plus, Minnesota has a and had and has a, a record and reputation to defend. Uh, in 2016 and 2018, two times in a row, we were number one in the country for voter turnout. That's something that we're proud of. That doesn't happen by accident. That's a lot of people who own that kind of success. But you can feel the pressure, right? And the only thing tougher than getting to number one, as they say, is staying number one, whether that's in business or sports or anything else. So the pressure was on Minnesota to perform at a high level and to get our people voting um, as many of them as possible, particularly during this difficult time. So I wanna to briefly touch on some of the many challenges we face. First, the pandemic. Second, I wanna say a few words about related litigation, some pandemic related, some not. Um, third, I wanna talk about possible disruptions at the polling place that we faced, or at least we're getting ready for. And then I just wanna talk about the results. What are the numbers? What are the outcomes um, that we can all be proud of? Um, so let's talk about the pandemic. It's a big deal. As you know, it hit in March. 
our presidential nominating primary, the first one we'd really had in a generation in Minnesota, our nominating primary was on March 3rd. And thank God it was March 3rd and not two weeks or three weeks later. Because by two weeks or three weeks later, um, things were really going down when it comes to the pandemic. You had the first wave of closures and uh, restrictive health orders, and it affected elections. It affected democracy in other states. You probably recall in late March, some of the scenes that you may have seen on TV or on other coverage, uh, long lines and upheaval, if not chaos, in states like Wisconsin, Georgia, and others during the primary season. We got in just under that, March 3rd, which is good. Um, but we knew early on, as of late March, early April, we knew early on, looking ahead to November, that this was going to be a different kind of election. You could already see the wheels turning and a lot of people's heads around the state who do this work, do this democracy work, that it was going to have to be different. It just was because of the pandemic. Um, and there's one particular um, calculation, literally a calculation, a math problem, if you will, that really crystallized it, at least for me and many people in our office. You didn't think there would be any math this close to breakfast. Promise there won't be a lot. This is a little bit of math, but it's easy math. And here's the math. We have 3,000 polling places in Minnesota, 3,000. And we were expecting about 3 million voters, give or take. That math works out quite nicely to about 1,000 people per polling place in Minnesota, 1,000 per polling place. Very rough average, it's a starting place, 1,000. And we knew from the standpoint of COVID, from the standpoint of public health, that we were gonna have to try to get that number down. It wasn't just us. If you go to the CDC website right now, you'll see their guidance on polling places. And what they say is pretty uh, common sense. Basically, uh, paraphrase, they say, use your head. Not that you shouldn't go to a polling place, but that there are risks in going to any place where a large number of people congregate in a relatively short period of time. In Minnesota's case, that's 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Those are the polling hours. And you should just uh, take precautions up to and including uh, other ways to vote. Um, other um, uh, less risky ways to vote. So we knew right then and there that we were gonna have to pivot to an emphasis on voting from home. This is not new, this is not radical, this is not COVID related or 2020 specific. Minnesotans have been voting from home by absentee since just after World War I, about a hundred years. Nothing new whatsoever, but um, though it had already been catching on and gaining steam in prior elections, uh, we knew that it had to do that even more this year. Uh, for us to have an impact and to make a dent in that thousand to one number. And so we did that. We, uh, we emphasized that throughout the summer. Um, we rebranded it as voting from home. You know, even the word absentee doesn't really fit anymore. It, once upon a time, you had to be absent to vote absentee. You could only vote absentee if you signed an oath under penalty of perjury saying that you were going to be out of town or you were too sick or disabled. We got rid of that in 2013. So now anyone can vote from home for any reason. Nobody asks the reason and it's nobody's business. So even the word absentee is kind of a dinosaur. So we disfavor it, even though it's the word used in statute and just refer to it as voting from home or voting early. And, um, uh, you know, it was already catching on, as I say, in 2018, 24% of voters voted that way anyway, almost a quarter. But we knew we, we probably had to build on that and get it a good bit higher. Um, and, and, you know, the normal reason for voting that way, obviously, is comfort and convenience. People have liked, even before COVID, before anyone had heard of COVID, people really liked voting uh, from their couch or voting with their feet up or voting whether watching TV or folding laundry or doing whatever at home. But this year, there, there was something more. This year, it was about minimizing personal risk. And more than even that, there was a public service aspect to it. The idea that every person this year who voted from home or voted early in person, was making it just a little bit safer for everyone who picked the equally worthy, equally legitimate option of going in on game day, on election day, and voting there. So it's a win-win, right? Those who vote from home get the safety and security of doing that. Those who show up in person, uh, uh, whether they know it or not, are safer because far fewer people are going to be mingling around in that space over the course of the day. So that was the plan. And, uh, and I have to give kudos here to the legislature. Um, uh, in terms of the pandemic, um, they really stepped up at, at our urging. They passed um, some uh, special legislation in the regular session in 2020, which did a lot of things, but I want to just highlight two of them. And, and they're very newsworthy and timely right now as, as we sit here today. One is they gave local governments a two-week head start to count all these absentee ballots coming in by mail. They knew and we knew that this was probably going to be a tidal wave. 
we could foresee in March and April that a lot of people were going to find this way of voting very, very attractive in a pandemic. And that, from an administrative standpoint, would present some challenges. So they gave a two-week head start, meaning picture these mountains of mail accumulating over the summer and early fall in 87 counties around Minnesota. A lot of people, I'll get to the quantities in a second, but a lot um, decided to vote that way this year. And we knew that um, they needed a head start. So a two week head start, starting two weeks before October 20th in this case, they could start ripping open those envelopes and feeding ballots into actual machines two weeks before. In the state of Pennsylvania, uh, notably, uh, their secretary of state made the same request and she was rebuffed. Uh, and they said, nope, you can't start counting uh, those ballots, can't start digging into those mountains of mail until after the polls close on election day, huge state with huge cities like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So, you know, when you hear all this talk about, oh, all these ballots are appearing, they're not appearing, they're being counted. This is the system that the legislature apparently wanted, which is to say, it's going to take days and days and days to count if you can't dig into those mountains of mail until after the polls close. And Philadelphia is the sixth largest city in the United States of America, it's huge. And so of course it's gonna take a few days. That's what you see playing out, but we didn't have that problem in Minnesota. The legislature also um, said that local jurisdictions could have more time after the election to count the ballots as well. So they didn't have to count everything by election night. They had a little wiggle room afterwards. That too really helped. And that was um, uh, showed great foresight as well. So the response was explosive. Um, we opened up the, the online portal to order an absentee ballot in mid-May and check out this statistic. In 2016, in the first week of the portal being open, one week, seven days, the portal's open, come on in Minnesota, order your absentee ballot for the either August primary and or the November election. After one week in 2016, statewide, 88 people ordered their absentee ballot, 88. In 2018, two years later, 173 people ordered their absentee ballot to come to them at home. This year, after one week, 36,880, 36,880. Let me repeat that, 88, 173, 36,880. When we saw those numbers, we knew that our predictions would be, were, were correct, that people were going to flock to this option to vote. And in the August primary, by the way, which is always a good dress rehearsal for the general election, we saw 60% um, of voters voted uh, by absentee. Only 40% of those who voted in the August primary actually showed up physically at a polling place on election day. So that sort of sets the stage, I hope, for the pandemic itself and the challenges that we face administratively. Let me move on next to talk about some related litigation. I could go on and on and on, and I won't. I, trust me. We get sued a lot, and that's okay. Uh, certainly don't take it personally. Um, that's what the courts are for, and if people have a grievance or they're seeking relief that's elections related, we are always a necessary named defendant. Um, and that's okay. At one point we had 22 or 23 live election related lawsuits going on and we're sued from all sides of the political spectrum, left, right, Democrats, Republicans, political parties, candidates, you name it. So we're sued a lot and that's okay. But this year um, it was even more than normal. Um, so let me, uh, and, and there were on all sorts of issues, you know, treatment of third parties, ballot order of the candidates, um, the status of Minnesotans who have left prison behind but are still serving a felony sentence on paper. And I could go and we could do a whole CLE just on those cases, but I don't think we should at this point. We shouldn't make this CLE that CLE, but let me focus in on just a couple of cases that were particularly salient and important this year. The first one was the LaRose case. It was brought in um, state court in Ramsey County, and that um, was a suit that um, dealt with the constitutionality of Minnesota's the as applied constitutional uh, constitutionality of Minnesota's witness requirement. We're one of 12 states that has a witness requirement for um, absentee voting. So you may have noticed in other years, if you voted absentee, you have to get a witness or a notary, I suppose, but, but most people get a witness. Uh, and it also challenged the constitutionality of our uh, receipt law, uh, again, during, um, uh, during COVID. So our normal law, the law on the books, is that if you vote from home by mail, you, uh, you have to get the ballot back by election day. It's got to arrive by election day. Otherwise, it won't be counted. What the, the, the relief that they sought was a postmark rule, which many states have, but we don't, at least on the books. And the postmark rule says you can postmark it by election day if it gets back by a certain day. In this case, the relief they requested was, was a week. Um, 
So at that time, we looked at the legal landscape and we looked at what other states had done and what courts had ordered, I, I should, should say, in other states, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Alabama, I'm missing several, but those are the ones that come to mind. And so we, uh, and there was some other relief that they sought as well, uh, that's not pertinent here, but we entered into a consent decree to that effect uh, to suspend the witness requirement and to impose just for this year, a postmark rule plus seven. So if you postmarked it by election day, but got it back seven days later, you were good to go. Uh, there was a full hearing on that for the general election in Ramsey County District Court. There were interveners from a major political party and a major presidential campaign. And uh, the arguments were had back and forth, um, but the judge did ultimately uphold and bless the consent decree. And, uh, and remember, uh, the standard, the legal standard for a consent decree is that a court must make a finding that it is fair, adequate, reasonable, and in the public interest. Fair, adequate, reasonable, and in the public interest. And Judge Gruing in Ramsey County District Court made such a finding. And critically, the interveners did not appeal. They did not appeal. They dropped their appeal. They did not go as they had planned to on accelerated review to the Supreme Court. They dropped their appeal, which tells me either they knew that legally speaking they were going to lose and or they thought it was just the right thing to do during a pandemic. So for whatever reason, they didn't appeal. All summer long, that was the rule or those were the rules. Um, in and through the primary, those were the rules. Our office spent money to send all registered voters an absentee ballot application, and those were the rules. And then ballots came to people by the hundreds of thousands all over Minnesota, and on it were those rules. Until the Carson case. Carson uh, was a collateral attack on the consent decree in federal court. Carson and uh, uh, Lucero were the two plaintiffs. Lucero, Eric Lucero is a uh, Republican state representative, uh, Mr. Carson is an elector. They were both electors, but uh, Mr. Carson is an elector for a pledge to President Trump, and they basically launched a collateral attack. Their theory, their novel theory, was that they had standing because they're electors that, and, and that somehow the consent decree violated Article 2's electors clause, not the elections clause, the electors clause of Article 2. So they sought preliminary injunctive relief. Judge Brazel uh, at the federal district court said no, that they lacked standing. So it went up on an emergency basis to the Eighth Circuit. Uh, there was a hearing on Tuesday, October 27th, one week before the election. The court went out of its way to reach the merits, even though only standing was technically before it. They went out of their way to reach the merits. And on the evening, the evening of Thursday, October 29th, the court released its decision. They reversed based on the Article II argument uh, the opinion, in my, in my opinion, was not a model of clarity. In our judgment, uh, the court ignored key arguments. The scope of the decision was not and is not clear, but the bottom line is what the court asked us to do was to segregate the ballots that came in after Election Day. So if anyone postmarked it by Election Day and it came back the day later, two days later, three days later, all the counties were asked, not asked, ordered to segregate those ballots, which they have done and are doing. And we'll have a fuller count after Friday of what the size of the pile is. The current size of the pile, I should tell you statewide, is mercifully low. Uh, not all counties have reported, but right now with I think about 55 out of the 87 counties reporting, that is under 1,000. It's like 955, I think is the number. So it's not a lot statewide. We got the word out and many, many others did in the intervening five days, please don't mail your ballot, don't mail your ballot, hand deliver it, have someone hand deliver it for you or go in and vote on game day, even though that wasn't your initial plan. And people seem to have gotten the message because so far the number is 955 in the entire state of Minnesota in that pile. So it's a small pile of segregated ballots. Um, so that was our litigation drama as well. Uh, I just want to touch briefly on order and safety at the polling places. Um, one of the things we knew we had to do was to get um, equipment and PPE and supplies to all the polling places, all 3000. And we did that for the primary and the general election. We had hand sanitizer and wipes and pumps and disinfectant and masks, of course, for both the election judges and for voters themselves. So that was good. Um, we worked really hard over the summer and the fall to make sure we did not suffer the same shortage of election judges that states like Wisconsin, Georgia, and others did, leading, as I said, to upheaval, if not chaos, at the polling place. So we need 30,000 people to do that job in Minnesota every general election. That's a lot. That's a small army. We don't hire them, train them, or pay them. Local governments do, and they did a fantastic job 
of filling the gaps that they knew they would have. The sturdy standbys who have done this year after year who tend to skew older and might want to step back this year, and many did, but they were able to fill those holes. But we had their back. We convened, I think, nine statewide meetings to come up with interesting, innovative, creative strategies to get people that were not just the usual suspects, and that clearly worked. Um, we did have the last month of the election some scares. One was um, poll watchers. You may remember in the first presidential debate, one of the candidates urged his followers to show up at polling places to be poll watchers. And I can't speak about any other state's law, but in Minnesota, our law is really, really clear. And that is, um, we call them challengers under our statutes, but the rules for challengers in Minnesota are clear. Every major political party gets one, only one, maximum of one person that they can designate in writing, has to be in writing at a polling place, just one, one Republican, one Democrat and so forth. So 20 people could show up at the urging of a candidate, but 19 of them are gonna be very disappointed. Only one is allowed in. The rule also says, or the law also says in Minnesota that challengers may not come within six feet of a voter, may not talk to a voter. And here's the key part, any challenge to a voter's eligibility must be made in writing and based on personal knowledge, personal knowledge. I think that's particularly key um, because it can't be based on a whim or a hunch or a bad vibe or a feeling or a question. So we'd be, it would be okay, for example, for a challenger under Minnesota law in a polling place to say, hey, wait a minute, I know her, I'm challenging her. I know her family, they live a couple blocks from me. She's 17 years old, she's not even voting age. I'm challenging her. That's okay, that's based on personal knowledge. What is not okay in Minnesota is to say something like, wait a minute, wait, 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 I'm flagging that guy over there. I'm challenging him. I heard him speaking another language in the hallway. There's no way that guy's an American citizen. Sorry, that is facially um, gonna be rejected each and every time, and it should be. That's just conjecture. That's just a guess. That's just a bad vibe. And that's not allowed under Minnesota law. So we made that clear. And we did not, in the end, have a problem with people swarming the polling places, seeking to be challengers uh, or, or, or poll watchers. Uh, you may remember about three weeks before the election, there was a little wave of anxiety that went through uh, uh, the ranks. Um, when uh, it was reported by the Washington Post, followed up by the Star Tribune, that a Tennessee employment agency had posted a job posting calling for ex-members of the military to come to Minnesota to help guard polling places. So uh, I talked immediately with um, the Attorney General's office, with local and state law enforcement. The Attorney General's office did a great job of getting an injunction uh, and basically uh, a promise by this employment agency not to do that. But again, it was an occasion for me and others to talk about what the law is. And the law is that no one who's not supposed to be at the polling place is allowed within 100 feet of the entrance of the polling place. Anyone seeking to help law enforcement is not among those included as being inside that 100 foot perimeter. Now, could they be 101 feet outside, uh, you know, armed perhaps? Sure, but we have pretty good laws on the books in Minnesota and federally against voter intimidation. It seems to me that that would be within the reach of those laws. And so law enforcement and others were on guard about that possibility, but it didn't materialize. Um, so what happened? Uh, quickly get to the actual results. Um, the thing that I'm most proud of and that you should be, I hope, uh, as well, is turnout in Minnesota was through the roof. Through the roof. For it looks like, uh, it's not totally official yet, but it looks like we are poised um, uh, with some cushion, by the way, for the third election in a row to be number one in the country. And not only that, but this is a modern day high for, even for Minnesota. So we were number one in 2016 with about 74.7% of the vote. That was number one in 2016. We are now, as of this morning, 79.85, just shy of 80% turnout, which is the highest turnout even in Minnesota since 1956. 1956, we were at about 82%. This would be the highest this, uh, since then. So really amazing, particularly given that this was during a once in a century pandemic. Absolutely outstanding in terms of turnout. Uh, 1.9 million people voted by mail from home or voted early. The vast majority of those voted from home. That's 58% of all voters. So just think about that. Everyone talks or many people talk about election day is the day that we vote. Clearly that's no longer true. Election day is the last day that we vote. It is the end of a long absentee period and the final day to vote only 42% of everyone who voted actually showed up physically at a polling place in November to vote for president of the United States or any other office. That's really remarkable. And I think over the course of time, it'll be interesting to see 
how many people uh, go back to voting in the polling place versus say, hey, I kind of like this. I kind of like voting from my couch and voting over the course of days and voting while I'm eating a bowl of cereal or whatever it is. I think a substantial portion of people will stick with it and not go back. Some may go back. I will go back because I love going to the polling place. I love bringing my kids and all the rest. So I'll probably go back, but many people won't and it'll be up to everybody. And hopefully we won't have a, a pandemic anymore. So uh, I, I just want to end by saying part of the success of this election in Minnesota, part of why we should all be very proud is really the absence, not the presence of, of, of a lot of things. We did not have a shortage of poll workers, though we thought we might. We did not have health issues in the polling place, though we thought we might because we had PPE and supplies. We did not see violence or, coer or coercion or intimidation because we really worked that problem. And I think people understood what the law was, that they couldn't just flock to the polling place. They couldn't help law enforcement. They couldn't uh, seek to be poll watchers or poll challengers because the law just wouldn't allow that. We have the guardrails in place. And I'm mindful of what the Supreme Court said once in a case about uh, polling places in America. At least aspirationally, the court said that they should be an oasis of calm. I love that, an oasis of calm. And in Minnesota, at least, our laws are designed to and have effectively provided an oasis of calm. Sure, there are uh, episodic um, uh, examples uh, where there's a dispute of some kind in the polling place, but we managed to get that. Despite all the pressure, despite all the anxiety, despite the high stakes, despite the once in a century pandemic, and that's something that we should all be very proud of. So um, it was a success, a resounding success from an administrative standpoint. And I am happy to hand it over now to Professor Schultz for his insights. And then I think after that, we're going to take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for having me. I just want to make a couple of quick comments here um, in terms of some of the points that you brought up here. Um, I got interviewed or was interviewed in the Star Tribune last week, and I think the story's coming out some point soon, just to sort of cheer since I live in Ramsey County. Um, it may turn out that Ramsey County um, um, had the highest voter turnout in the United States. Um, we don't have official on that yet, but we were well above 80%. For those of you who are also Ramsey County people like me, we get to jump up and cheer. Again, not official yet. The second thing is that the turnout um, in terms of Minnesota and nationwide, in terms of going up directly, uh, I'm putting on my political science hat for a minute here, not my law professor hat. It's completely consistent with what everything we've always been taught. Um, taught that voting is kind of a cost benefit decision that if we lower the costs of voting it increases the it increase the opportunity to vote turnout will go up um clearly it did and so that's just kind of a quick side comment here what i want to do um is is make a series of talk about a series of themes in terms of the election this year and then get us to a little bit with some of the post-election um litigation also but i'm going to be somewhat brief so that we have plenty of time for questions too but I'm going to suggest there are about a half a dozen themes, um, five or so themes maybe in there um, that describe the election this year. Um, some of these are sort of political themes um, that I want to weave in here. But the first one was that we entered this election as an incredibly divided country. And unfortunately, we exit this election as a very divided country. I mean, we all knew about the enormous partisan divide in this country. And that partisan divide, I think, clearly um, permeates just about everything for the election cycle this year. And I'll weave that theme in a little bit more as I talk. The second thing um, to point out here is that the 2020 elections are not over, you know, is that we've had, of course, the media declare um, that Joe Biden is the winner, but we still have a variety of things to occur. Canvassing boards still have to meet um, to certify the final results. We still have to have election certificates issued. Um, there still has to be what? Um, has to be the at the presidential level. We have to have the electors meet to cast their votes, um, which will happen on December 14th. And we still need to have Congress on January 6th actually um, verify or certify the electoral vote. Uh, so a lot of things still to happen at this point. And even at the state level, I don't know how many races are still outstanding here, but we know nationwide um, that that the U.S. Senate races are not over. And in early January, control of the U.S. Senate is going to come down to two special elections in the state of Georgia. Uh, 
parenthetically, I guess I would say that I think this would be a good time for all of us um, if we want to make a second income of be selling ad sp television ad space in Georgia, because it'll be absolutely phenomenal in terms of the advertising that's going to go on there for the next couple of months. Another theme which is going to surprise you is that I'm going to argue the elections were entirely predictable. And I know the Secretary of State and all of you are going to say, what do you mean entirely predictable? I'll explain in a second. Then I want to talk a little bit about the litigation. We know that this was already the most heavily pre um, litigated pre-election in American history. Um, the estimates were up to 400 lawsuits uh, had been filed across the 50 states in the country. And I guess for what the secretary said, 22 of them fell on Minnesota's head. Um, but there certainly were a lot before, and we're seeing them now afterwards with the president vowing uh, um, to continue you know, lawsuits after the election. And I'll assess that a little bit. Now, again, I don't need to spend too much time talking about how divided we are. I think most of us understood that division um, in terms of what it was, but, and, but I wanna weave this back into a discussion in a few minutes here. Now, for some of you who are thinking, what do we mean by the fact that the election was entirely predictable? I wanna take us back about a year, about to let's say December last year. And I'm an academic also, um, I do write, and I, have a, and I was plotting my third edition of my, of my book on presidential swing states. And the whole premise of my book on presidential swing states has been the argument that in many cases, presidential elections are over way before they start. And what I mean by that, because of the electoral college, which means we don't pick the president by a national popular vote. Um, instead, it's a 50 state election plus the District of Columbia. Because two, that in 48 of those 50 states, we um, the electors are allocated on a winner take all basis. And three, um, because of the intense partisanship in the United States now, where we rarely see split ticket voting or cross party voting, put those together, I've argued for several years, that well before an election, we can, we can almost predict how the election returns at the presidential level are going to flow from places like, like places like from New York, California, um, Massachusetts, um, Washington, Louisiana, Utah, Oklahoma. So last December, as trying to plot what, what states to have in my book, I said that, listen, if the election were held last December, um, my argument was that the election was largely over in 43 states, that we knew how 43 states were going to go. And I argued that the likely Democratic nominee, and I was sort of figuring it would be Joe Biden then, um, that I said a, a likely Democratic nominee would start with 222 electoral votes, that Donald Trump would start with approximately 205 electoral votes. The election would be over in roughly, again, 43 states. The argument was that there would be 11, not 11 states, I'm sorry, seven states, seven states um, um, totaling 100 electoral 111 electoral votes that would decide the election. Those seven states would be what? Arizona, Florida, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So my argument was that's those were going to be the seven states that were going to decide the election, the outcome. Um, I did also throw in my book and say, well, Obama won Omaha back in 08. Maybe Biden has a chance of winning um, Omaha because Nebraska is one of the two states in the country along with Maine that doesn't do the electoral vote on a winner take all. So I said, let me throw that in as a possibility. Called the person who's my author um, for that chapter in Nebraska and said, do you think it's a possibility? He said, yeah, it could happen. I also thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe Georgia is getting close to, to swinging. Um, the demographics of the state are changing. Um, there's significant mobilization down there Threw that in. So depending on how you counted it, I had somewhere around seven, eight, or nine states that mattered. Also in the research that I'm doing, I, I've done for the last few years, I have found that, that within those swing states, it basically comes down to what? Comes down to that in each critical state, critical swing state, there's one or two counties that drive the election. For example, in, a, in, in Pennsylvania, when Philadelphia County uh, or Bucks County, or I always argue Lackawanna County, which is where Scranton is, you probably win the state. Um, North Carolina, win Wake County, if you're over in um, Michigan, Oakland, or Wayne County, et cetera, et cetera. And so it came down to what I argued about 11 counties. And then this shows us the polarization. I said, listen, at the end of the day, within those swing counties, there's only about 10% of the voters that truly matter. 
So going into this election, and I'm going to type this in to the chat box so everybody sees the number here. I said the only numbers that you really needed to know to understand this election um, were these four numbers. 10, 11, 7, 2, 70. 10 percent of the voters in 11 counties strewn across seven states would determine who gets the 270 electoral votes. Um, um, in real numbers, I said, yeah, we're probably looking at only 50, 60,000 people who might really drive this election. Alternatively, I argued that maybe the election would come down to what? Come down to the three states that decided the presidential election th four years ago. It was what? Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Those th three states, um, um, a difference of 85,000 votes. Specifically, what I mean is that had Secretary Clinton won um, picked up 85,000 more votes across those three states, but particularly in about four counties, she would be president of the United States. This speaks to our polarization, how few votes matter. And so this election started off, and I would even argue um, into September, in um, late September, it was what, roughly about those seven or eight, nine states um, that we were thinking about, uh, including the state of Minnesota. Quickly, though, um, the state of Minnesota dropped off the list um, for a variety of reasons um, in terms of the fact that this election, unlike four years ago, um, um, the Democratic candidate actually showed up and campaigned. Um, four years ago, um, Secretary Clinton didn't come to Minnesota to campaign, which was a fatal mistake, taking votes for voters for granted. Um, Donald Trump showed up several times, um, and that was why the state got very close, among other reasons. So in one sense, this election was proceeding the way I thought it was going to go, that we looked at where the candidates were traveling. It was getting down to these seven or eight states or so. Um, by the time we got to um, late October, it looked like it was going to be what? The three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, that were going to drive the election. But at the same time, then it even got closer. Um, as we got into the last week of the election, it was down to Pennsylvania. So in some sense, all of this is entirely predictable. The, the, the election, the states that were in play, um, the counties that were in play were entirely predictable. Now, of course, all of you are going to say to me, whoa, Professor Schultz, you're ignoring that. Guess what? Since since uh, since December, when you made your predictions, um, we had a pandemic, a crash of the economy um, and George Floyd and the aftermath all affecting the elections. Yes, I fully acknowledge all that. But guess what? In many ways, what this election was always going to be about was what? Donald Trump. If four years ago, the election was a referendum on Hillary Clinton, two years ago, it was a referendum on Donald Trump. Um, uh, elections like this where a president's running for a second term are always a referendum on the president. And it was, and even more so um, in the sense that why his character was going to be an issue. And he, as Donald Trump, was going to be a marker in the sand. That, that this election was always about him. And because of our polarization, our partisanship, um, our divide, division. Issues such as what? The pandemic, the economy, um, the, the what happened to George Floyd, the, the peaceful demonstrations afterwards, the riots that occurred afterwards. And notice I divided Floyd into three separate entities here. All those were partisanly reacted to, um, looked at in very different ways. And at the end of the day, um, they all became in many ways surrogates for what you think about the president of the United States or placeholders for how, how the president is actually viewed. Therefore, we also know how people viewed things such as what, again, speaking to partisanship, um, it also came down to what? Wearing masks, not wearing masks, all partisan. The one area where I think the coronavirus, the pandemic kicked in really hard, and the Secretary of State talked about this, was the push towards accelerating a trend that had already been occurring in the United States, which was a push towards early voting. But this becomes important because that early voting has the potential of expanding the pool of the types of people who vote and the number of people who vote. And so we, we did eventually see that. In fact, one of the things I'm gonna argue um, when I get all the data, is that one of the most fascinating things in Ramsey County is the fact that for years, um, we had high voter registration for, let's say, Asian Americans, um, in fact, higher than white Caucasians, but actual turnout, uh, there's a precipitous drop. This election, I'm suspecting that we saw people of color, um, especially Asian Americans, have a high voter turnout um, and, and not see that drop, but that's a different story entirely to talk about here. But nonetheless, the COVID um, pandemic um, 
pushed towards more states allowing early voting, people wanting to allow more, uh, wanted to participate in more early voting. However, this is going to be important to the legal challenges coming in in a second here, which I'm going to get to in about a minute, um, is that this also meant um, that, that the President of the United States uh, was sharply critical of, of that early voting. And again, try and be as nonpartisan as possible here. Um, he was arguing, for example, that the early voting, the vote by mail, um, absentee, whatever word you want to use here, um, were what? Um, were full of fraud, full of a variety of problems in terms of um, um, basically being corrupt. This is despite the fact that we have known overwhelmingly for years that, that voting in the United States largely is devoid of fraud. In-person voting is almost negligible, and even absentee, although there's a little bit more incidence of it, um, is still quite low, um, or distance voting quite low. Uh, I always tell people, and, and I took part in a study of this many years ago with the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, that you could um, that you have a better chance of buying a Powerball ticket and winning the Powerball than you do of showing that voter fraud is a significant issue in the United States. We know that many states, including Minnesota, have years of experience allowing people to vote by mail with no real problems. And several states, including five of them, have consistently used vote by mail um, with, with, um, uh, with no problem. The reason why I mention this is that there was a partisan divide that we knew that Democrats were more likely um, to be using vote by mail. And if we tracked parts of the country where the requests for early voting or rather where absentee ballots were coming from, they were from heavily Democratic areas. Also, again, suggesting that unlike four years ago, where Democrats were not motivated to vote, um, this time they were heavily motivated to vote. So this brings us then to election day and also a point that the secretary made. We also know that in many states in the country, including what, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, ballots are not counted before election day. They are counted after the polls close. Um, um, uh, Jim Jung said, why were Democrats more likely to use vote by mail in 2020? Because the president of the United States was heavily criticizing um, vote by mail and arguing that it was what um, fraudulent, it was um, corrupt, uh, there was a high degree of fraud in it. And he sent a signal to his, his um, uh, um, uh, to his, his base. And also this is setting up an argument, which we're going to use now in about two minutes about his post-election litigation strategy. So I'll be right with you in just a second here. Um, and, and so we got to election day. Now, the, um, so, and if you're watching election night like I was, we um, you saw early on that Joe Biden was off to a lead in places like Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio. Um, if you were a Democrat, you were popping champagne. If you were a Republican, you were popping Pepto-Bismol. Um, eventually, those leads faded. Then we started to see Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, Biden off to early lead, and then what fades and goes behind. By about 1230 on Wednesday morning, um, if you're a Republican, you're thinking, well, guess what, this election's in the bag, Trump's going to hold those critical states. Um, if you're a Democrat, uh, again, you're, you're, you're pretty worried at this point. We see Arizona, Arizona coming in pretty close at this point, looks like the Democrats are going to win. That is election day. As I always tell people, and this election even more so, election day is the first cut at getting, of, of tabulating the ballots, that we need a few days afterwards to get all the tabulations done. That's why we have things like canvassing boards to finally about a week or two later certify elections. And what we started to then see on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, is all those early votes, those vote by mails come in. And they were perfectly consistent with what? The polls were telling us that Biden was probably going to win those three critical swing states of, 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 of what? Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. They started to roll in. Uh, and eventually what we saw is that those, those three states flipped. Uh, we also saw eventually Georgia go to, go to, um, 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 to Joe Biden. At least we think it's going to go to Joe Biden. Okay, where I think we are right now, I need about two more minutes, about three more minutes here, and I can outline all my remaining points here. Um, is that where I think we are right now? Is that we have about 309 electoral votes um, that are probably going to go to Biden because I'm throwing in Georgia at this point in terms of his camp. Uh, the pre in order to win the presidency, you need 270 electoral votes. 
Uh, so, so Biden appears, apparently has more than he needs. Remember, none of this is official. We have not had canvassing boards certified. We have not had election certificates entered. Um, this is based upon media projections and fairly good statistical projections of what's going to happen. Uh, what we are starting to see now um, are a series of, of lawsuits being filed by the Trump campaign, as well as demands to do some recounts. Let me approach the recounts first. Um, in Wisconsin and in Georgia, um, um, there, there's going to be recounts. Um, um, Georgia was relatively close. I think, what, 15, 1600 votes. I may be off a little bit on that. Wisconsin, it's the mid 20,000s. Recounts rarely change the outcome of an election. I know all of you are going to say Frank and Coleman did that in 08. Frank and Coleman was an incredible exception of a very close race where a very small number of votes matter. But we know that in general, and credit goes to all the secretaries of state and election administrators across the country, that the initial counts are highly accurate. Generally, recounts don't change statewide um, voting by more than a few hundred votes, three, four hundred at most. It's unlikely Trump wins on a recount argument. Now, the second argument is, um, what about the claims of voter fraud? And this becomes kind of interesting, that the core argument that the Trump campaign is making at this point um, is, about, is about voter fraud, claiming that there were you know, tens of thousands or millions of, 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 of votes fraudulently cast. What he's mostly describing as voter fraud is what we're seeing happen across the country, especially in those three states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. What he's arguing is fraudulent, is saying that ballots that were legally cast before election day, but received by election day, those violate what's called the Federal Uniform Election Law, which requires that federal elections take place for our purposes this year on November 3rd. So his argument is any ballots that are counted after November 3rd um, are, should not be counted. And if they are counted, that's fraud. Um, largely, he's going to lose, uh, lose on that argument because um, federal law doesn't prevent absentees from being counted then. This is different than the issue of ballots postmarked on election day than received after election day and counted. In the states that, that Biden has won that are in dispute, uh, we are not looking at that latter batch of ballots. Um, a second argument um, that the president is making is what I'm going to call a garden variety of other fraud type of issues. Um, issues regarding, as Secretary is pointing out here, about maybe not being able to have somebody look at the ballot counting or other claims about, about some types of fraud. I think what in Pennsylvania, there was a claim that what ballots were being brought in in pizza boxes. Um, Judges have so far largely um, rejected those suits, claiming you have failed to substantiate uh, any, any of these claims. In fact, if you look at the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times today, election administrators across the country, including secretaries of state, and our fine secretary of state, Steve Simon, is quoted in at least one of the articles, pointing out that voter fraud was largely absent. Lastly, there's also some people who are saying there's a parallel here to Bush v. Gore. No, there's not. Let's go back. What was Bush v. Gore all about? Bush v. Gore is a dispute in one state 20 years ago in Florida where the two candidates were just a few hundred votes apart. And what the legal challenge there was an equal protection argument eventually where what the court said, Supreme Court said is that different standards for assessing voter intent um, across the county um, violated the equal protection clause. Now, most of us think that should have been a due process argument, but I don't wear the robes to make that argument. Um, but nonetheless, it was about one state, about some disputed ballots about voter intent. Here, for the president to prevail in his legal arguments, he's going to have to overturn what? A minimum of, of three, if not four states to get Trump or to get Biden from below 309 to below 270. That is a tough road to hoe. Even if he can prevail in one state, it doesn't mean he's going to prevail in others. And also, in general, what judges will do is be highly reluctant to overturn elections because you really can't rerun an election. And what will oftentimes happen is even if you can show that there's voter fraud, what a judge might say, let's use Wisconsin as an example, I think right now 
Biden's ahead by 22,000 votes. Let's say you can show that there were 5,000 fraudulently cast votes. What, the, what, what a judge will say is, okay, Biden's ahead by 22, knock those five off. He's still ahead by 17. He's still the winner. So it's going to take an incredible amount. Um, the last time we had an election overturned, uh, North Carolina a couple of years ago, um, the courts basically concluded that the election was so thoroughly tainted um, with fraud, so unreliable that there had to be a do-over. So, so somehow um, the um, um, but anyhow, the point I'm getting at here is that it's unlikely that on legal arguments he's going to prevail. And for the, all of you, since you're all attorneys, um, the route to get to the Supreme Court is, is going to be pretty difficult on this. And so I don't think he's going to ultimately prevail um, in terms of, of winning. Uh, so let me do, let's see, a couple other things I want to say here. The other thing I was going to mention is that, and I think the secretary mentioned, let me just do a couple of questions here, is that I'm going to actually argue that election day was boring. And what I mean by that is that everybody was fearful of significant voter intimidation or conversely fearful of significant voter fraud, especially given the fact that 100 million people um, voted from, you know, voted in advance. It was largely pretty quiet. And I think that's pretty good. So a lot of people got 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 worried about things that um, that largely didn't materialize. And I'm glad that happened. So let me work backwards here. Naomi, is this the core argument that if the ballot was legally cast but received uh, after it shouldn't be counted. Yeah, that's, uh, wait, no, no, actually the core argument is that ballots legally cast before the election and received by election day, those ballots should not be counted because they violate the federal uniform election law. Um, um, and that's, that's, that's the core argument is that uh, is that they had to be in by November 3rd in order to be counted. Um, that federal uniform election law doesn't prevent that. That's different than a pile of ballots that are what postmarked by election day, but of which are received after election day. Um, those are two different sets of piles here um, of which the president wants both excluded, but he wants that former excluded also. Okay, um, let's see, are we about Trump maneuvering to use the military insurrection? No, I'm not at the end of the day. Um, I, don't th I don't think the military is gonna come out. If I want to be totally cynical here, um, um, given how much he's disparaged the military, um, I would be more worried if I were Donald Trump that the military escorts him out on, on January 20th. But, but realistically, keep in mind, the Constitution says that the current president's term expires on January 20th, um, 2021 at, at, at noon. Um, if he doesn't want to leave, he's a private citizen at that point. Um, so he's no longer in. So let me sort of stop here. Um, and then if um, Jennifer wants to pick other questions for us to work from, et cetera, et cetera, we can go from there or, or however we want to go. But let me sort of stop there. Sure. Um, there have been several questions about the electoral college and whether we might see some sort of election reform, uh, potentially getting rid of the electoral college or um, adjusting it somehow. Could the two of you address that? Sure, let me say a couple of words first, is that remember that the electoral college is found in article two of the constitution and in the 12th amendment. Uh, to amend the constitution, you would need two thirds of both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states to ratify them. Whatever we may think of the electoral college, good or bad, I, again, sort of tongue in cheek, I've been saying, I doubt we could get two thirds of Congress and three quarters of the states to agree to the idea that sunshine feels nice. Um, it's just, it's not gonna happen. So the Electoral College is not going anywhere foreseeable. Um, even though about 60% of the American public wants to get rid of it, partly now the Electoral College is faced with a partisan divide also in this country, which I think is it make it more difficult to get rid of. Now, my own personal view, this is just my own personal one, and I've got a piece coming out in the South Dakota Law Review um, in a few months about this, um, is that given the fact that we can't get rid of the Electoral College, um, remember in 48 out of 50 states by statute, the electors are allocated on a winner take all fashion. I actually favor the Nebraska and Maine model of an allocation system roughly based upon congressional districts. Now I know not everybody agrees with that, um, it wouldn't get us to um, dead score on straight popular vote. And there's some arguments to be made also that, that having the Electoral College um, confines mischief. You know, if let's say um, 
something were to have melted down in Minnesota and it didn't, and it went crazy in Minnesota, who knows what would happen like that. Um, the recount or the problems are confined to Minnesota and not nationally necessarily. Straight popular vote, it might encourage a variety of, of litigation across the country. Uh, quickly, uh, to give time for other questions, boy, we could do a whole CLE on this, and it's an issue I'm passionate about. I support the National Popular Vote Voter Compact, so it goes back to first principles. What is the Electoral College? What is it? It's a point system. The, the, the framers basically said, hey, based on population, every state gets these points. We're going to call them electoral votes. And states, this is the critical part, states, you can allocate them any way you want. There's some people who uh, misunderstand and believe that the, the framers somehow sided with winner take all. They didn't. They said, we're going to have a point system. It's a, we're going to call it this name and you get to allocate them any way you want. So if Minnesota wanted to allocate its 10 electoral votes to the tallest candidate, dumb idea, probably constitutional, or the candidate with the most letters in his or her last name, that's also a dumb idea, but we could do that. And what I'm arguing and what many others have, if you go to nationalpopularvote.org, I think it is, you can see, it's that states should choose, as the framer said they could, to allocate their electoral votes, their points, to the winner of the national popular vote, which would ensure that each and every time the person who gets the most votes wins the election, just as the person who gets the most votes wins the election in every other office under the sun. We could do a whole CLE on that. In fact, I think it'd be a great CLE for us to do if, it, if you have time getting us closer to December 14th, it wouldn't be a bad one. Sounds good. <laughs> um, let's see, a couple of other um, questions. Well, lots of other questions. Election judges report the number of challenges, successful and unsuccessful, at closing. Um, I'm not sure if those reports are compiled or who would do it, but the information is, oh, that's not a question. Um, but there was a question that came in about election judges and, um, uh, you know, um, why have, are election judges barred from speaking out? Uh, uh, about their experience um, to counter the, the um, questions of fraud? No, there's no bar. They can talk. They can't name names, but they can talk about their observations, and they do, which is helpful. Um, particularly now, it's helpful with all the allegations of, of, of fraud out there. Um, none in Minnesota that, that I'm aware of um, so far. Uh, but nationally, I think that's important for people who are actually there to talk about what they saw and what they didn't see. What do you expect to ultimately happen with the Minnesota law requiring elections to be delayed when a major candidate dies close to the election? Uh, this is yeah. regarding the Craig and Kistner case. Right. Well, that's a live case right now, so I have to be a little bit careful. But this goes back to a law we passed. I say we. I was in the legislature at the time in 2013. And it really arose from the Wellstone plane crash issue, where you had a major party nominee with days to go died in a plane crash, then the incumbent senator. So what do you do? What is the fairest thing to do? Knowing that any outcome, any scheme that you, you try to write into the law is going to have some disadvantage. So we all, and it was very bipartisan in 2013, said, look, the fairest thing to do under that circumstance going forward, doesn't matter whether it's Democrat, Republican, another major party, is to kick it over three months later to a special election. And so that's the law that, that we collectively wrote. What the court said in the Craig case was not so fast, not as to federal races. And so far, the status quo right now is no, the show must go on when it comes to federal races, US House and US Senate. So my read of the current state of the law, this is a live case, but the current state of the law is as to federal cases, you can't do that, a state can't do that, the show must go on, the election has to take place in November, but as to all other offices, so for governor or state auditor or state senator or whatever, that will continue to be the rule in Minnesota. If a candidate dies or is incapac incapacitated within a certain number of days or weeks of the election, there will be a special in February. Yeah, and that's consistent with, by the way, other federal rulings that said that the, that the federal government can, can regulate federal elections, but they can't tell the state of Minnesota what to do in their own state elections. And so, that's, and so I, th I think it's largely preempted, I agree with you, Secretary, um, for the federal election, but it raises, a, a, you know, federal elections, but it raises a couple of imp important points here to think about. And we were talking a little bit about this before we went on, is that as, as we're going to have more people early voting, you know, maybe, you know, 45 days before the election, um, 
one of the things that could possibly happen is what candidates are going to pass away. Um, it's happened in the past. How are we going to sort of adjust the idea that we want more flexible early voting within how do we figure out what to do if a candidate passes away? And then the part we were also talking about um, is, is what do we do now if people early vote um, um, as they're allowed to do under state law, but then they pass away um, before election day? And again, we were pointing out, Minnesota is one of those states that doesn't allow a person to, to have their vote cast. But believe it or not, folks, in some states, I'm about 20, about 20 states, the dead are allowed to vote. Um, that, that if they voted legally before election day, but passed, passed away before election day, um, their vote still counts. I just mentioned this because the early voting is, is, I think, good, but it's transforming and creating new issues that we need to be thinking about. Good point. Let's sneak in one last question here. Uh, can Trump keep his fraud cases in court long enough so that some states cannot certify their electors by December 14th? Possibly, but I think one of the, the things that I'm going to say that Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court case, was adamant about. Um, and part of what got so many people upset about that decision is when the court ruled back then 2020 in December and said that the state of Florida was violating the Equal Protection Clause. It needed to have uniform standards for determining voter intent. But then it said because we were getting close to what's called the safe harbor provision, a point that says six days before the election, if a state um, has it's resolved all its electoral college um, disputes resolved, we would then give presumption or Congress to give presumption of validity to the electoral vote count when it went to Congress. The court seemed pretty adamant of saying, we want the litigation um, done by, th by then. Um, I think the same thing's going to happen here. I think roughly December 8th is going to be the date that it occurs. Now, here's also an interesting question that we don't have an answer to. Okay, um, so, and this goes back to the Electoral Count Act of about 1880, whatever, I can't remember now. Let's say, for example, um, there are two or three states whose electoral college um, votes are in dispute. Um, and therefore, we don't have 538 being cast, but we only have, let's say, a smaller number. It is not clear from reading the constitution, um, if it requires that a person get a majority of all 538 that potentially could be cast or a majority of all those that were actually cast. This is actually somewhat of an open constitutional law question. So I just mention this because even if there are some in dispute, um, um, it's not sure how that impacts it, but ultimately remember, I wanna to connect to one other question here, Ultimately, when Congress meets on January 6th, um, at that point, um, if there is no person who has a majority of electoral vote, uh, the House of Representatives picks the president, which each state um, getting, you know, getting one vote, not voting by, by individual member, but by delegation. And my reading is now going to be interesting here in terms of the fact that what Minnesota, uh, you know, is going to be what, probably 4-4. Four, four. Um, in terms of the congressional delegation. If we were to go that route, it will be interesting to see um, how this gets resolved in terms of how Minnesota votes. But ultimately, my point is, is that I think it's unlikely. I think the courts are going to cut off um, 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 uh, litigation um, in order to preserve states' ability to do the safe harbor provision. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are a few minutes over our time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. So I think we should cut it off there. But thank you both to our two presenters. We very much appreciate your time here and have a fantastic day. Thank, thank you. you.